It is really my great honor to have David and all of you, my friends and colleagues at Kellogg. I'm really excited about this great seminar, and this is actually the first time that I joined the seminar. And in the following about half an hour, I will be showing some photos that I took during my fieldwork in China, as well as showing a short video clip. And overall, I really want to share with you what I've done, uh, which had taken me from the London University to Oxford, and that is my PhD project. We will think about consumption as well as the human labor behind production. And uh, all this began in 2010. We are going to look into a new generation of Chinese workers and the life and death struggle of these workers. And based on a study about Apple's supply chain and its supplier in China, what we will learn from it, uh, we really want to think broadly about the changing geography of production, the global division of labor, and also how the Chinese governments, including the Czech unions, are protecting workers' rights. In 2010, uh, 18 young workers who commit suicide, all of them were between 17 and 25 years old in the prime of their youth, and they are all from the rural countryside. 18 individual workers who killed themselves. 14 died, only four survived with crippling injuries. And local media dubbed the tragedy as Suicide Express. We have been thinking about what's wrong with it, why driven them to hopelessness and desperation. And at that time, I already went to UK, start doing my study. And as you can see from this uh, photo, it is in the independent. There have been the reports about these young workers as well, and they are producing our iPhones and iPads. Instead of thinking about the root cause for these suicides, the managers, they promote uh, by holding a rally, and these workers have to put on the t-shirts that are provided by the company, saying, I love Foscon. So what had driven them uh, to take this desperate means, does it relate to work pleasure? Or in the defense of the company, it is only about uh, breaking up with their boyfriends or girlfriends because they are in heavy debts. So all these are the defenses that put up by the management. But while we look deeper into what the management are doing, they try to say that workers have to pledge low not to make uh, commit suicide. Or the company also put up the safety lets, try to catch the jumpers from killing themselves, jumping off from the rooftop. And then as we dig deeper into the workers' block, we see that here is one post that we translate. Perhaps for the Foscon employees and employees like us, the use of death is simply to testify that we will ever live at all and that while we lived, we only had despair. So they are taking their own lives because they do not see any hope. Everywhere seems just to be the despair and they end their lives. We had the chance to talk to one survivor she was only 17 years old, born in 1993, and after 12 days of losing consciousness, she awoke. So this is a miracle. But she later on also found out that from the waist down, she could no longer walk. Uh, she became paralyzed. So forever in her life, she might end up just in the hospital bed or in a wheelchair. This is the first job of her, and it could be the last in her life. Gaining confidence and trust in people like us, the interviewees, is uh, such a difficult journey. <laughs> but we established relationships, a friendship with her to have some support. And she began to tell us that actually she was working in the business group called IDPBG, Integrated Digital Product Business Group. There are more than 12 of these kind of business groups within Foxconn Factory because they compete against each other for quicker, shorter delivery time schedule, 
higher, better product quality. Uh, so you have to really work as quick as you can. And despite the fact that she had been working at a full speed, she is always yelled at, shouted at the fact that she, you made mistake or you're becoming too slow. So you can feel the pressure on the shop floor. And after one month of work, she didn't get the wage on time. So without money, all the money the parents gave her had already spent. So when she jumped from the fourth floor of the factory dormitory, she told us her mind became blank. So this is the story that she told us. And this IDPBG only serves Apple exclusively. And they're making iPhones and the original iPad in 2010. So this is the larger background about the individual story, but a, a whole generation, the cohort of young workers in China. In China nowadays, there are 274 million migrants who are from countryside. They are better educated than their parents. And rural China seems to them there's not much prospect in finding a good job, changing the family conditions, just like the young girl you see, she actually wants to improve the lives for her younger brother and sister. Working on the farm, you will not be starving. You will be OK. But if you're thinking more in the countryside, that is so desperate. And the young people, they see city as the life, the hope. And this is why since the opening of China in the late 1970s, we see the rural to urban migration, and she is one of them. China has become the world factory with the opening up, with the inflow of the foreign direct investment. China had become a place for the investors. This is a paradise. We have cheap labor, abundant land, very convenient law, very relaxed environmental rules and regulations. So this is in the 80s and 90s when China had the uh, shoe factories, garments, electronics, and all sorts. And this also is the time when Western companies are looking for overseas markets. So this is the background in the early 1970s when there was the oil crisis, and these companies outsource uh, that means they just put out the very low value added manufacturing to the East Asia with Singapore, Japan, Taiwan, which raise along the technological uh, innovation and competition become the top tier suppliers and manufacturers for these IT brands. As you can see from this map, this shows you the distribution of the Apple suppliers around the group. And uh, you will see quickly, China is the important the strategic global production base for Apple, as well as all other companies. But this is important. When we look into China, we find out that Foxconn is the largest private employer. It is the largest electronics manufacturer with more than 50% of the global market share. OK, let us just stop for a second and think about how many electronics gadgets you have. Yeah, you are using the camera to take some pictures. We are using iPhone, using the computer, desktop, laptop. So one in every two is assembled by Foxconn. Foxconn is so big. And it gains the largest revenue from Apple alone. About 40% based on our manager's interview, the income are from Apple. Uh, the relationship between Apple as a buyer and Foxconn as a supplier is so closely related. Uh, but um, I also put down all the logos here because Foxconn indeed receive all the orders from other companies, Dell, IBM, Sony, Amazon, and so on. Let us take a look into this company, the Taiwanese company Foxconn Dan. Uh, this is not a domestic Chinese company. It is a Taiwanese invested firm with the founder, uh, Terry Goh, in 1974. So it is only about 40 years ago. But it changed the whole world by providing one-stop shopping services for all the big companies. And the milestone of Foxconn is that in 1988, Foxconn invests in the southern part of China 
then expanding all over the country from the coastal to the inland region. Nowadays, Foxconn has more than one million employees in China alone. We're talking about one million. <laughs> if this room could hold a hundred people, then a thousand, ten thousands, this is such a big scale. Uh, you can think about Ford uh, or other huge companies in the early 20th century. But nowadays, uh, Foxconn is the largest uh, electronics manufacturer in the whole world. And take a look at the ranking. By measuring the annual revenue, the sales revenue, Foxconn is now at the 31st place, and it is getting closer to Apple, which is on the top spot of 15th. Uh, but the annual revenue for Foxconn, which is just uh, what we say non-brand uh, company, it, it is not selling its brand. It is just doing processing and final assembly, but could have such a huge share of the profits. Uh, that is amazing. Well, Foxconn, the parent company is called Honghai Precision Industry. Therefore, when you look at the logo, not only Foxconn, which means to build the electronics con connectors at high speed, like Fox-like speed. Uh, and next to it, you see the red color logo with a capital H and a small h. That means uh, Honghai, the Taiwanese parent company's name. And in Chinese, Foxconn is so interesting. It has the good meaning about being wealthy and healthy. But after the train of suicides, it becomes just a dark irony. <laughs> yeah, however, this is really the good meaning of the Chinese company name, Foxconn, being wealthy and healthy. Foxconn, until the 2010 suicides, was the sole supplier of iPhone. Apple gave all the iPhone orders to Foxconn itself. Over the, these years, because Apple had suffered from bad publicity because of the suicides or protests, and then it spreads the orders among other Taiwanese companies as well as other contractors. But it cannot really cut off the relationship with Foxconn. Foxconn is so big, so important. So the interdependencies is very clear. And you can see that uh, from the breakdown of Apple's revenues by product, iPhone is the revenue generator. <laughs> it is more than 66% of Apple's income is generated from selling all different models of iPhones, then followed with Macintosh and iPad, iWatch, TV, all different products. Take a look at this pie chart. This is important to understand the uneven uh, power relationship here. While we see that the lion's share is Apple, which will got gross profit nearly 60%. Imagine if an iPhone is selling just 100 US dollar. Apple will got the biggest share, and then raw materials <coughs> is only about one-fifth. Suppliers like LG, Samsung, other high-end components is about 14%. And take a look at the solid uh, slice. The Chinese workers, while they are doing the assembly day and night, less than 2% would be what workers will got. So we come up with a concept that is about the buyer-driven supply chain. This is an interdependent supply chain, but with Apple, which is really making the key decisions on the prices, product quality, and product delivery timetable. And this, in the end, translates high pressure onto the shop floor. This is how when we don't just look be, be within the factory wall, but uh, in a global perspective, we understand how the buyers, when they place the orders or with their purchasing practice, will have the concrete impact onto workers' lives and their working conditions. So buyer-driven supply chain is a key concept that we analyze global production in China. And not only about the squeeze of Apple, which always wants to have lower cost and higher profit margin, but you see the beautiful, elegant design of an iPhone 6S. Uh, people are queuing up day and night, just want to buy an iPhone. And the very round, smooth corner, 
thinnest and lightest iPhone in the whole world, just like Air. So these are the magic advertisements we keep listening and seeing. And with the 60 minimus, uh, minutes uh, documentary program, you could see how the Apple's hardware engineer received the interview and say, every tenth of a millimeter in our product is sacred. So it is so important to keep the product design so detailed and sophisticated. But while you have such a high demand on quality and design, it also has the real influence on workers. So they have to live up with the high quality standard. Inside Foxconn, there are many slogans like these, achieve goals or the sun will no longer rise. <laughs> Value efficiency every minute, every second, because time is money. There's no a second to be lost. Execution is the integration of speed, accuracy, and precision. There's no best way, but always a better way. So push harder, harder until you fall. So the devil is really in the details. These are the day and night 12 hour shift that workers are under all these strict monitoring. So inside Foxconn, workers will tell us that they are under a paramilitary regime. This is a very strict management method. There's no margins for mistake because the product itself is so expensive, it is luxuries. Uh, it is much more than a month income that the worker will make. So to just understand more about their struggles, their hope or their discontents, I decided that I have to do the undercover research. <laughs> so I just uh, pretended that I'm one of them. <laughs> I borrowed the staff card and their uniform, it was during the summer, and I live with them in the dormitories. Many dormitories are actually heavily guarded by the security officers. However, uh, because they have, as I say, more than a million <laughs> over so many different factories, so I could still sneak into it and without uh, making alerts or the managers do not know uh, that I've been doing interviews and taking pictures during the research. So this is the map. Uh, when you see all those red dots, they are the Foxconn's production sites. Only the one in Shenzhen City, which is on the northern border of Hong Kong, at the peak, they have more than half of a million uh, workers, only in two factory premises. It is a huge scale. But um, apart from Guangdong area, I actually went to Chengdu in the southwestern part almost the latest uh, newly built factory. It is interesting, inside Foxconn Chengdu uh, in Sichuan province, they only produce one product for one client, and that is iPads for Apple. I deliberately chose this site to look into the causal relationship. We do understand that Foxconn's engineers and managers, they station inside the factory. But when the product deadline is approaching, all they care is not the proper rest break or lunch uh, time for the workers. It is keep working and working. So all the internal guidelines that Apple have, the supplier code of conduct, their protective uh, rules and regulations, they are all put aside. So this is the video that me and two other friends, we make it. Uh, without <laughs> proper company approval, but this is uh, the real, <laughs> the real scene, the uh, inside Foxconn that you could see uh, from your own eyes. So now I will show you the six minutes uh, video clip, and that we would see the video together. So I just try to open it and allow it. <laughs> I want to play it now. Ah, lovely. Okay, I will sit down just
治呃最大的困难。这富士康就流传这样一句话嘛，女人大脑的用完了，人就等星期五，就这样的。我让我们起的比地道嘛，去的比狗粮嘛，吃的比猪肠嘛。
下那么那么了解一下我们，了解一下我们这个东西怎么项目的。其实人性化不是喊出来的，是做出来的。We can leave it at the moment. Oh, thank you. So let me stop it. Just try to. So I really hope that the video will also help us to see the conditions. At that time, this iPad uh, city, so-called, had already opened for about six months. And uh, when uh, I and two other friends, we were there, uh, we did uh, about three months interviews and finally made this short video. Um, the explosion happened in May 2011. Already at that time in March, April, workers are already complaining that they are inhaling the aluminum dust into their lungs every day. And those dust, just like uh, the small particles in the gray color, will stick onto their face and fingers as well. There are the masks, there are also gloves, but they are as thin as paper. It doesn't really protect you at all. And when I saw them, I thought they are the coal miners, or they do not know how to protect themselves. They just use the simple soup uh, to wash their body, and that's all. And most of them have coughing and other problems. And the explosion happened when someone turned on the lights, and the aluminum dust already saturated in the air, and it could combust uh, and, and explode into fire. So two uh, workers die immediately. Uh, dozens of them have seriously burned and disfigured. So is it the um, uh, accident or the man-made uh, tragedy? We had the protest uh, in Hong Kong. This is a student group called Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior. We have a large group of teachers around uh, eight different universities in Hong Kong and we had the street uh, protests and actions to call more consumer awareness. Just the fact that was, we already finished our brief reports and uh, rough cuts. The very first rough video, we sent it to both Apple and Foxconn <coughs> by the end of April. And on the first of International Day, um, the Labor Day, it was published in the headlines in the Observer. We collaborate with The Guardian. We provide them with all the materials. They are happy to carry this news report. After one week, Foxconn replied to us that our conditions are perfect. The conditions are safe. Workers are OK. And Apple kept silence all the way. So this is why two weeks later, the conditions was ripened for the explosion. So this is a very uh, pitiful uh, intervention that we tried for our first time <laughs> in 2011. But what you cannot see from the video is the fact that there were even younger workers who are only 15 or 16 years old, and they are so the so-called interns, the student interns. They are taken all around <laughs> from the vocational schools, and they are working on the iPad, iPhone, and other Dell, HP, assembly lines, doing what they call the internships. The internships could last from three months up to one whole year. Because in China, the rule is that the first two years, you have to receive classroom education, learning some vocational skills, theories. But in the final year, you should have interview or 
job skills training in the workplaces that fit your major. But all these kids that I've been talking to, they are majoring in arts, music, <laughs> uh, computer, and all different kinds of majors. So there is the huge mismatch here. And Foxconn could bring them in. And the number is not just talking a, a small one. It is up to 150,000. And because they are the interns, they are not legally defined as employees. They do not receive any employment contract. So they are the student interns, or the student workers, we will call. Behind the Foxconn's mobilization, it is the local governments. The education departments direct the vocational schools to send all their students to intern for Foxconn or Honda or other big investors within their city because they are bringing new capital. <laughs> they are stimulating the job market and local governments want to collaborate with them by providing not just land. As you can see in the video, there are already many villages that are being completely destroyed and demolished because you have to provide land, industrial land, for Foxconn and other investors. But not only that, with China, the demographic change over the past two decades or so, the supply of young workers in the labor market are shrinking. Therefore, vocational schools becomes a site, a primary source of cheap and flexible labor. They do not have a choice to decide where to do internship or not. So this is a modern kind of forced or unfree labor that we discover in our project. And you can see the mockery, the news here, we see a cartoon. All these young students, they do not have the eyes to see because they can only brightly follow the orders. They do not have the mouth to speak, they cannot complain, no one will listen. They only have the ears to yeah, follow the order, listen to the order, and that is to endure the internship. So if I just stop my presentation here, you will feel very disappointed. I'm giving such a depressing <laughs> talk. But in the following, I want to really highlight at least two dimensions. And they are what I would see some possibilities of change and the hope. So the first dimension is really about all of us here. I'm so grateful that you come uh, despite you're so busy with your own studies and your job. But you come here because you might concern about global trade, fair trade, or justice. So consumer, consumer campaigns. This is also what we have been doing, at least in the past five years. We target Apple and other image conscious tech companies, and we leverage the idea about corporate citizenship or corporate social responsibility. You set the standards so high <laughs> that you have to put it into practice. And if you don't, we will pressure these companies to measure up to those high standards by taking immediate remedial actions. And we would provide all these information to have the concrete evidence to tell that Apple, you are sure the workers in your supply chain will be safe, uh, healthy, they would be having decent wages, reasonable time to rest to be with their families. But all these are not m materialized on the ground. So what's wrong with it? And we do believe that nowadays, <laughs> there would be the opportunity. You take a look at the revenue uh, by region. Apple's market in China, which has been growing, you can see that nowadays, one fourth of the income generated for Apple is from China, from Greater China, no, which includes Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China. All the other market segments, like America, Europe, Japan, and the other parts in the Asia Pacific, the market had been slightly decreasing. But only China, Greater China, that had been expanding. I really believe that if consumers in China, in the US, in the UK, if we have some more artic articulations or collaborations, we could change, we could put pressure on these IT companies. You cannot say you are dedicated to education while exploiting the future of these interns. 
and also other rural migrants. But Apple probably feel the pressure and the heat. That is why since 2012, following the suicide explosions and worker strike, they form an advisory board. This advisory board is made up of eight academics. When I did my PhD and now in the postdoctoral stage, I still find their work fascinating. <laughs> I really learned a lot from Richard Locke, Mary Gallinger, and I know Eli Friedman personally. So they are great scholars who focus on globalization, labor studies, um, and particularly a pirate form of governance. If the state do not take action, do not implement the labor law within the nation, so what can we do? Would there be the possibility for private companies to monitor the corporate behavior, the production base? So this is the mainly the uh, idea that would be supported by Richard Locke. And he wrote a book, The Promise and Limits of Private Power. So what the companies might do to promote the labor standards in a new global economy. Perhaps our standpoint is quite different from them. <laughs> they are better to talk with the companies, to sit down, to just modify some labor policies, uh, social standards, environmental standards. Therefore, they are the group of people who signed the confidentiality agreement with Apple and formed the advisory board. But they didn't talk to me, neither my teachers who are based in Taiwan and China, and we have been devoting at least the past five years in the project. So they didn't talk to us, but they would like to assemble its advisory board. I just want to say that consumer pressure are important. It is not straightforward or simple, and there are also counter tactics how Apple will try to improve its public image by having partnership with the established scholars as well as other third party. Uh, there are barriers, there are challenges, but consumer con uh, action would be important, so as workers themselves. I also see the second point is workers themselves. In China, these workers, they understand the generalist uh, attention, and also there are scholars and students who care. And therefore, they did one action that is to threaten to jump from the factory as an informal way of bargaining. Because the, obviously, the formal channel of sitting down and collective bargaining, there's no such mechanism, no room for workers to negotiate with their managers. Therefore, they kind of take the radical actions. This time, no one really jumped to kill themselves. But they are able to use this as the pressure to stop the assembly line, and managers are forced to talk to them on the rooftop. And they finally got a parcel victory. They have some gains in their wages. And they use social media text messaging to send off this picture. So this picture is not taken by me. This time it's taken by the worker, and they send it to us. Now I will see that there are some possibility to unite with workers themselves. When these worker activists, they want to make their voice, they understand the importance of getting together to build solidarity. But in a structural condition, we also see that it is not easy at all. Because in China, the labor market has been so fragmented and divided. We got the rural migrants, student interns, agency workers who are employed by an agency but dispatched to a user firm. So it is different from other regular workers. All these are the divisions that forbidden workers to form a bigger collectivity. And also workers nowadays, I will just quit and find another job. So short contracts without knowing each other quite well, difficult to build confidence and trust, uh, frequent job change, short, short and prominent contract, unstable jobs, all these are also the negative factor that are in play. And therefore, every time when we look into these protests or strikes, it only lasts several hours or at least several days and then it's over. It's so difficult to carry on and because precisely the trade unions are very much dominated by management themselves, usually the union inside the factory is also the personal assistant of the CEO <laughs> or other personnel department manager. So it's really not gaining any confidence 
by the workers. There's no representation we are talking about at the factory level. And the bottom line is, in China in particular, the state as well as the employer, they share the common interest. And that is, there's no tolerance at all for independent unionism or freedom of association. Workers have to be stopped from organizing themselves into an independent body, and they are not allowed to form their trade unions at all. And all these would be matched by the government power or the force. So strategic repression, if the government are willing to give some concessions and negotiate just for the sake of maintaining stability and the peace for investment, that is just one side. Another side or another hand is heavy suppression or repression. Police, riot police will be called into to arrest and detain the activists. It is not a safe environment to organize openly. We need lots of skills. And because the workers themselves, as well as their supporters, like the NGO, non-governmental organizations, we are running high risk in organizing or forming workers into different uh, organizations. It could be an alumni group, it could be based on an industry, it could be based on their own provincial origins. We are all from Sichuan, so maybe we can form a group. But all these forms of organizing are crossing some line when the state look into the autonomous uh, space or workers self-organization, they will put more pressure. And President Xi Jinping, despite the fact that he has been talking about harmonious society or most recently China's dream, we are talking about how to rebuild the state and labor relations and when I did my field work, I saw a banner, it reads, uh, well, I translated from Chinese and it reads, realize the great Chinese dream, construct a middle class society together, consolidate the party's foundation, build a harmonious society. This is definitely the ideological uh, state that the Chinese government wants to be strong, uh, the rise of China, uh, the, the whole world being a ha 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 hegemony vis-a-vis uh, -vis the states. There had been the strong economic growth over the past nearly four decades. But what about when we think of the sacrifice of these young workers who even lost their lives they do not think of changing another job, they die, they stop the line. That is what we interpret as an extreme form of protest. But suicide shouldn't be used as a means of protest. So nowadays what we're doing, we write up the books. This is the French uh, version and the Spanish one is now undergoing. Uh, one of my co-author already passed away. He indeed is one of the Foscon workers. When he passed away, he was only 24 years old. In this book, there are the poems and the voices of these workers. There is the cultural form of resistance right here. It is not about forming a political party or an independent union, but it is their vicious. What they are hoping is no longer to be their parents farming on the field, which leading to nowhere. They do want to build their homes, have their families in the cities. Um, but there's just no pathway to be successful, or successful in the sense that how people <laughs> will see them. Um, when he passed away, there had been also some of our friends who translate the poems and publish it uh, online. There is also another book that I am working with my two teachers, uh, Poon Ai and Mark Sheldon. Mark Sheldon is a historian based in New York, while Poon Ai uh, is originally from China, but now based in Hong Kong. So we are doing a book with the Spanish version, Italian, and traditional Chinese published in Hong Kong about the Chinese version, unfortunately, um, all the 3,000 copies were already destroyed by the government. I didn't even see it myself. It just happened around 10 days ago. Um, during the new year, I, I heard the news. I thought there are the censorship, there are issues that are 
not being accepted at all by the local government and the central level, so it's all gone. Our only hope now is to try to finish the English version later this year. There might be also the corporate lawyer who might be dissatisfied with the name Dying for an iPhone. <laughs> Dying for an iPhone, it invites the lawsuits from either Apple or Foxconn or other powerful players that are being named in our book. But even if the corporate lawyer is okay with it, we are still uh, having some trouble with how the government will see uh, this publication. So it might be still really difficult. Um, but we are trying to do that because behind the false cons ma managerial tactics, which are telling you that you can have your dream here. You will one day become as successful as Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. But all these workers are telling you repeatedly that we are seeing no hope. Every day we're just like a roadblock. Our brain gone rust because we're just doing simple assembly jobs. So now I am trying to finish one very short piece uh, for China Dialogue. This is a bilingual uh, online uh, short article that I'm working on, and I hope that will generate more discussions in the public areas, uh, not just within the academia. So I'm really happy that I got the opportunity here to share some of the findings, and I really look forward for your questions, comments, and suggestions so that we can build a stronger labor movement. So thank you so much. <laughs>